thank you for joining and listening to God's Word with us today. Right now, we are in a series of Like Never Before. We believe that there will be breakthrough and you will experience like never before moments in your life through God's Word. Hope that this sermon will be a blessing to you and your family. We are starting a new series from today. Last week, we completed <coughs> a series called Soul Detox. God has been speaking to us uh, over the, through that series and over uh, every single detox that has been going on in our soul. And God has restored us, I believe, and it has given us an opportunity through the 21 days of prayer to implement everything that we have been learning. This morning, for the next three to four weeks, we are going to look into this new teaching series called Like Never Before. Turn to the person next to you, look at them and tell them, our pastor is going to preach like never before. <laughs> Why do you all laugh at me? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, this is going to be a series like never before. Now turn to the person again and tell them, you are going to obey God's word like never before. Again, look at them and tell them, you're going to shout amen and hallelujah like never before. Hallelujah. Come on. Amen. God wants us to experience like never before moments in our life. There are so many things that are across the world that happens, and sometimes we are stunned by it. They build huge buildings, and they want the world to see because this is a building like never before. Sometimes newly married couple, the wedded, uh, newly married wife, she would cook a nice meal and wants to bring it to her husband, and the husband tastes it and says, this is something I've never had before. And she says, that's sambar. <laughs> God wants us to experience like never before moments in our life. Joshua chapter 10, verse 14. There has never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. That verse was written in the Bible because Joshua had the audacity to pray a prayer that was tenacious in nature, that was audacious in nature, that was a relentless, faith-filled prayer. He said, sun, stand still. Moon, be still. And the Bible says the sun and the moon stood still, not at the voice of God, but at the voice of man. So everybody were amazed and it was written, there has never been a day like this one before or since. Joshua had a like never before moment or experience with God. Moses had a like never before burning bush experience. His burning bush experience was like never before or since. This morning, I want to talk to you on this title as we are in day six of our 21 days of prayer. And throughout this week, God has been talking to us about faith. And I want to reemphasize into all of our lives from this series of how to have a faith in your life like never before. Like never before. A faith like never before. If, if you are writing notes, please write this down. A faith like never before. We all need faith like never before. But pastor, why I've been, I've been in the faith for a long time. I've been a Christian for a very long time. I've been in ministry for a very long time. I've been following Jesus, being his disciple, attending every single meeting, any revival meetings, any crusade, giving everything possible. I've been doing it. Why do I need a faith like never before? 
Let me tell you why. Because there is a time coming into this world like never before. And we all need a faith like never before. We all saw a pandemic like never before. And I'm pretty sure that it stirred up, it either stirred up our faith like never before, or it put us away from God like never before. Two things happened. Some people walked away from God, questioning God. Some walked into God, knowing that God is still on the throne. The best is yet to come. I'm not talking about fourth wave here. I'm talking about what God wants to do in the spiritual realm. The best is yet to come. Even though the world faced a pandemic, God still was on the throne, moving and stirring in the hearts and lives of people. People have lost their loved ones, yet they experienced God closest to them like never before during this time. How did it happen? A faith like never before. Hebrews 11, 1, it says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. People are still living in despair. People are still living in hopelessness. The author, when he wrote this in Hebrews, he was writing to an audience called the Messianic Jews. The Messianic Jews were the people who left Jewish tradition, but wanting to follow Jesus and became disciples. As they left their Jewish traditions and started following Jesus, halfway through, they started having a doubt. Halfway through, they started thinking, maybe we should go back to our traditions. Maybe we should go back to where we came from. You know, for all these years and years and decades and decades, we had our Torah. We had our traditions. We had our sacrifices. Now, all of a sudden, they are saying that there is a chief high priest who gave the ultimate sacrifice. And now we don't have to sacrifice anymore. Now we don't live under the law, but under the grace. And this is all too much. We need to get back to our temple. We need to get back to our tradition. We like religiosity more than relationship and they are at the verge of quitting. And the author of Hebrews is writing, you cannot follow or have a relationship with the living God through a law mindset. You need to taste him and see that the Lord is good with a grace mindset. If you understood that, say amen. It takes faith to understand God. It takes faith to follow him. It takes faith to see him. The Bible says he is an invisible God, but yet you and I can see him, can feel him, can experience him, not by might, not by our own words, but by faith, but by faith. This is the reality of faith. You know, it says faith shows the reality of what we hope for. What is the reality of faith? You can write this down. The reality of faith is faith is not an emotion that you feel. If you think that faith is a feeling, it's not a feeling. Faith is a substance of our trust in Lord Jesus. Faith is the most tangible thing that you can ever have in your life. Faith is like a muscle that needs to be worked at. It's not a feeling that you just feel and it goes away. If you keep faith in an emotional level, what happens is that when things go wrong, then all of a sudden you stir up yourself to pray in faith. To you, faith is an emotion. When everything is fine, you don't feel stirred up in your heart to pray because now things are fine. Faith cannot switch on and switch off. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith has to be a constant thing. The reason faith has to be a constant thing is because faith comes from the word of God and not from the promises of any man. Faith is stirred up in our life. The promises of man will give you feelings. It will give you an emotional hope, which is temporary. 
But the promises that you receive from the word of God is constant. It is not an emotional attachment. It's a realistic, tangible lifestyle, everyday experience of experience with God through this relationship with Christ Jesus. That is faith. Faith is key if you want to experience God. Write this down. Faith is living our life in the action of God's word, even when you don't see it and feel it. Faith is living our life in the action of God's word, which means that every day we act according to the word of God and we do it in faith. When everybody is fearful, when everybody is crumbling on the inside, when everyone, when the rest of the world is saying there is no hope, this is, this is a despair situation, we cannot move forward. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we don't take a step back, we take a step forward because the Bible says that if you can step into something with faith in your heart, God will move and go in front of you. Our faith will not be parallel to what the world is doing. In other words, if you live out your life in the action of God's word, you will look strange to everybody. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, Hi, stranger. Has anybody said, why do you make such strange decisions to you? Why do you make some courageous decisions? Like, like why are you so calm and chilled? You're, like, you're supposed to be nervous. Like, there's... Did you hear what the doctor said? But why are you, why are you calm? Has anybody said you're the odd one out? All the odd ones, put your hand up. Amen. The odd ones are the chosen ones. You're odd. And you will look odd. Because you're not even with the world. If you're not odd, then we are even with the world. If we are even with the world, then we are not living our life out of faith, but we are living through our calculations. Imagine applying this in every area of your life, in finances, in the way you pick a school for your children, in the way you teach your children faith, in the way you walk your life, in the way you work at uh, your workplace the way you deal with your colleagues, your manager, your boss, and the way you walk and talk in college, in your universities, in your school. Imagine living this out in every area of your life. You'll be the strangest person for everybody. And let me tell you something, that's okay. That's okay. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, if you're odd, it's okay. Just make sure you are odd because of the word of God and not anything else. I want to give you three things this morning quickly. Three things that we need to do if we need to experience faith like never before. Number one, obey God like never before. That's where it starts. Number one, write this down. Obey God like never before. Hebrews eleven seven. 7, it says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. So obviously, who is the odd one here? 
Noah is the odd one. He condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. If you are standing for God, then it might look like you are standing against the world for which God will give you righteousness by faith. He will add righteousness to your account of faith. If God had a balance sheet and he had righteousness as a credit that needs to go up in your account, how much times God would have added righteousness into your life as credit because of some of the decisions you took here on earth for God? Think about it. Think about it. See, in this context of what is happening with Noah is that Noah was standing among a demon-possessed, devil-infiltrated generation. They were so far from God that God did not want to have them. They were so crooked in nature. They were so possessed in sin. They were so fallen that God wanted to press reset button. But then they, he saw one man who was righteous in the eyes of God. He saw one family that stood for God. And God called Noah and said, okay, you need to build an ark. And imagine this, it took Noah 120 years to build this boat. Do you know that? He did not build it in a month. He did not build it in six months. He had to go to church for 120 years and every New Year service, everybody will ask, boat ready, ah. Where is the rain? 120 New Year barbecue celebrations, Thayalan. 120 years of obeying God in faith, even when he did not see a sign or a single drop of rain. Obey God like never before. A lot of us ask God, this Saturday you woke me up, next Saturday if you wake me up, I know it is you, then I will obey you. I was like, thank God for that point. I'm going to use it for my sermon during testimony. I was like, yes, God. We, that is human nature. We ask God for signs to obey him. When he has given an entire directory full of words to obey him. We still ask God for signs when God is like, hello, I was on the cross. Is not not that a sign enough for you to obey me? I shed my blood. God sent his only son because he loved us so much. And he rose again on the third day and we live in his resurrection power. Is that not good enough sign for Christians today to obey Jesus who saved your life? Who's the king of kings and the Lord of lords over your life? Is that not a sign enough for us to obey him? Isn't it sad that we're still asking for signs? God, if you, if you, just, if you just turn my shirt green to blue, or if I can just cross the road quickly, if I can just get a parking space today, you know, we pray such praise. Okay, it's great if it's working for you, but let me tell you something. Can you obey God like never before? with a faith that cannot be shaken in your life and believe God for greater things. I am talking, I believe I'm talking to movers and shakers of this world this morning. Look at the person next to you and tell them, he's talking about you only. Someone says, oh, pretty, ah, okay, so look at, what, what is he saying? You know, we need to step up. We can't keep drinking milk when God wants to give us solid food. There is so much revelation from God's word and God wants us to go to the next level. January, you start Genesis. 
February again you start Genesis because you forgot that you have to complete Genesis by January. Then again March you start Genesis because you couldn't finish it in February. Then May, April, April, May, you're like, okay, Genesis is something wrong. Let me start from Matthew. Then you go to New Testament. Let's move forward in his word. Let's obey. Genesis 6, it says, Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. And he did that in obedience to God's word and voice for 120 years. His children would have mocked him. His family would have mocked him. People around him, that generation who was totally infiltrated by sin and evil nature would have mocked him. But he did not let anything stop him. Today, God is not building an ark, but he's building a church through you and I. And he wants to save the world. And he wants to get more people in this ark of the church before he comes back. And God is building his ark, the church, through you and I. At that day, there was only one Noah. Today, there are a lot of odd ones here. You're all a Noah, called by God. But are you having a faith in your life that is crazy to obey him like never before? And consistent in your obedience like never before? Oh, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed for a week. Looks like God is taking a break from answering his prayers. He's offline. I'll come back next year and I'll pray. Oh, I asked, I did this for God, but nothing seems to change. Oh, I did that, nothing seems to change. 120 years of obedience when there was nothing. Obey God like never before. Here's the second thing. If you want to experience faith like never before in your life, choose God like never before. Choose God like never before. Faith demands a choice. Faith demands a choice. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, it says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Watch closely. This is what it says. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. No, um, Moses made a different choice. Even though he could have enjoyed the pleasures of sin, he chose to share the oppression of God's people. The moment he realized his true identity, he was 40 years old, when he realized his true identity that he was a Hebrew, Hebrew and uh, he refused to be identified as Pharaoh's family. And he stood with God's people. He thought, look at this, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept the right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Where is your eyes fixed today? Where your eyes are, that's where your choices are. Let me say this one more time. Where your eyes are, that's where your choices are. The reason being, your entire life is driven by your thoughts. Psychologically, your thoughts drive your actions. Your eyes will keep on looking at the things that you are thinking about. And if you are thinking about the pleasures of sin, 
If you are thinking about the things that are not of God, that are far away from God, then you will not see faith stirred up in your life. It is really important that we understand this. Faith demands a choice. Either you're with God. If you're not with God, guess what? You are against God. You cannot have faith and sin in your life. Choose. You cannot have love and hatred in your life. You cannot just experience grace from God and live with unforgiveness in your life. You cannot experience generosity from God and still keep things away from the people who need it the most. Choose and choose God. Faith demands a choice. Moses know the shame that he was going to see. Moses know the criticism that is going to come. Moses growing up in the palace, then recognizing his identity. He went away, but he went away by faith. And then he had a burning bush experience. He had an encounter with God like never before. And God brought him back. But this time, he was not just any man. He was a man with audacious faith. He had his doubts. But he did not let his doubt overcome him. He allowed faith to work in him and through him. When God said, you know, throw that stick that is in your hand so that I will show who Yahweh God is. He did not have a time of negotiation with God. God, are you sure you're going to do this? Which we do most of the times like, okay, God, I'm going to take a step forward. This week onwards, I'm going to do it. Are you with me? Maybe you're not. Let me wait. I'm going to start giving tithe from this month onwards. But I need to know it will multiply and come back. Okay, let me test one rupee. Like, you know how they add a beneficiary in the bank account or in GPA and then they send one rupee to see if the GPA is working? Yeah? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? You can relate to this? They just send one rupee. Like that we do. Okay, got one rupee. Two rupees were there. No, it's not coming. Okay, it's not working, Pole. G pay. God pay. You don't pay? Okay. You said no in your word that you should test and see. Faith does not look back. It does not look from the perspective of the world. It is like a child just going for the father, blindly believing and trusting, knowing that whatever that God the father has ordained for us is for our good. That's why when Shatrach, Meshach, Abednego, when they were in the fire, even if our God does not save us, he is still our God. Which means that I don't need God to prove to me that he is God. I know he is God. Even if he doesn't bless me or not, even if I don't get that money back or not, even if, my, even if, even if, even if it does not happen, he is still my God. That's a faith choice. That's a faith living. That's a faith living. Don't try to live like a banker with return policies. And with confirmations and agreement, people write agreements with God, contracts with God. When he is our ultimate truth, make a choice. Faith demands a choice. You can either have God or you can have the world, but you can't have both. Amen. If you're with me so far, say amen. amen. All right. I know it's not one of these sermons that woo, clapping types. Maybe God is speaking to you or slowly listening, but let God speak to you. Number three, take courage like never before. Take courage like never before. Number one, obey God like never before. 
Number two, choose God like never before. And number three, take courage in God like never before. I want to talk to you a little bit about a teenager who had a courage like never before. This teenager was standing in front of a mighty army. Did I give you a clue? Have you already guessed? Who is this teenager? He was part of the verb of those days. It was in verb. He was a teenager who had a unique perspective about God. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 26, David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Let me point out something. Whenever you heard the story of David, what is the title you heard? Whether in sermons or Sunday school, in Kingdom Kids, the story of David and the story of David and Goliath, right? The giant. David killed the giant. David killed the, you know, the more you say is a giant, you don't feel courage. Realistically. He was a Goliath. His, his height was this much. His sword was this long. And he spoke with such intense volume. He did not need sound system. The entire nation could hear his voice because he was so big. And then there was David. You know, we do this. We amplify problems in our life and turn the smallest thing into a Goliath. I'll tell you, I'll show you because this teenager did not look at Goliath the way we taught our children in Kingdom Kids or Sunday School or, or VBS or any youth meeting or in any church. It was not a story of David and Goliath because Goliath did not look like a giant in David's eyes. I'll tell you why. It says in verse 26, he says, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? There's nowhere in the Bible, David called him a giant. There is nowhere in the Bible, David went and said, whoa, he looks so big. There's nowhere in the Bible, it says David was awe, in awe of his enemy. Look at his perspective. He says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is he, man? Who is he? That was his perspective. That was his eyes. Let me tell you, there's a hermeneutical challenge coming to all the KCLC students right now. If something is repeated, in the Bible, it means it's an emphasis. There is an emphasis because see what happens again in verse 36, 10 verses later. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This is David's prayer to God. He's getting ready now to take down, not the giant, but according to him, an uncircumcised Philistine. He says to God, your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. How you see demands the courage that you have inside you. We need faith eyes. A son lost a contact lens. It was very expensive. It was almost 25,000 rupees. He said, mommy, I went and looked for it everywhere in the house. I just 
couldn't find it. Mommy said, I'll go look for it. She went two minutes. She found the contact lens. The son was so surprised. He's like, I've been looking for it for a whole hour and I couldn't find it. And you found it in two minutes. The mother said, you were looking for a contact lens. I was looking for 25,000 rupees. perspective and all the parents said amen <laughs> you know when David looked at Goliath he saw it from his spiritual eyes the moment he called him the uncircumcised Philistine it changed the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. Because David understood that he is an Israelite who worships and follows Yahweh God. And he is the mighty God. He is the Lord of Host, and I am a circumcised Israelite, which means that I live under the covenant of God. Whoever is not under the covenant of God does not matter to me. That was David's perspective. That's he understood the power of of God. He understood the power of God's covenant. Stay with me. Stay with me. You see, if he saw it with physical eyes, if he saw Goliath with his own physical nature and measured his height and the size of his helmet, he wouldn't have picked a stone. His weapon was totally irrelevant to the problem that was in front of him. This is why we keep telling, pray. Prayer, okay. But we want God to do something. It's a big problem, pastor. It's not. Not for God. Not for a living God. We see prayer like a, a second option. If everything does not work, then okay, pastor, you say pray, that is fine. prayer No. We need to go to the bank. We need to talk to the manager. We need to do this. We need to do that. I need to call all my relatives. I need to tell everybody about what has happened. I need to accumulate more loans before God can bring a breakthrough. Then I will pray. This time when you pray, you have more prayer points. First day prayer point. When you prayed the first time, you had only one prayer point. Only one problem. And you did not pray then. Now you have gone and done your own thing. And now you pray. Now you have 50 prayer points. It might look like a small stone and a sling, but that's all you need. When you look at the problems, not through your physical eyes, but with the eyes of faith, with the spiritual eyes, it shifts the nature of the problem. And you see, David understood he is nobody. He's an uncircumcised Philistine and I am a circumcised Israelite, which means that I have Yahweh God, living God with me and he has nobody. If you have nobody, you don't even need a sword, man. I just need a stone. I just need a stone. It takes one shot and you're gone. That was David's faith. Take courage like never before. David understood the power of the covenant that he was living in. Are you living under the covenant of the Christ that has set for us? Do you understand the power of the covenant that we have 
through the blood of Jesus. You can be with Jesus, but the question is, are you under Jesus? Are you wrapped under his covenant? Are you washed under his blood? Are you protected under his supernatural, Holy Spirit-filled lifestyle? Do you have that? If you have that, it's just a matter of a stone. When you don't live, then according to the word, then everything looks like a giant for us. Then everything looks like a huge problem. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Again, it says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. In other words, you're not fighting with us. You're fighting with God. If somebody is touching you, they are touching God. We are God's children. That is why we will never be fearful as a church because if somebody is trying to church, uh, you know, touch the church, they are touching God. If somebody is trying to come against you, they are trying to come against God. But we need to stand with God during the battle. The problem is God is fighting for us and he's looking, Dave, where are you? Da? I'm fighting for you only. We are not with God. We are somewhere, somewhere else, you know, looking and making our own solutions, sitting in our own cocoon of anxiety and fear about the future. And God is like, I am preparing your future here. What are you doing that you come here? I am preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And you shall be blessed. I've got things ready for you. But can you just be under my banner? That's what David says. I don't come with my name. I come with the banner, which means, you know, it, the banner was Jehovah Sabiot, which means the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabiot, which means the Lord of hosts. He is the mighty army of God. That was his name tag. That was his, um, his identity. He did not go as David. He went under the banner Jehovah Sabiot, the Lord of hosts, the mighty army of God. How are you looking at your problems? How are you looking at your pain? How are you looking at things that are going on in your life. Take courage. Have a courage like never before because Jehovah Sabaoth is with us. Amen. Thank you for listening to our sermon today. Hope it was a blessing for you. And if you would like to support our ministry, you can do so by visiting kingcitychurch.org forward slash give. We will meet you next week with another inspiring sermon. God bless you.